Try that. Let's try that again. Hello. I am technologically challenged. My daughter and uh, son remind me of that. And we'll start with that with the fact today is my son's 33rd birthday. It doesn't seem possible. And one small rabbit hole I was going to be following with that anyway. Um, but it applies to this. About 18 years ago, I was going through a personal crisis. I'll leave that part private. That's not, it doesn't belong in the airways. I'd be glad to share it privately, but not in this context. And I was at work, so I called my wife and asked her to pray and asked the children to pray. I worked night shift at the hospital. Came home Sunday morning. It was about 8 o'clock. My wife's already dressed, ready for church. My daughter's getting ready. And my son, Dan, who's at that time was about maybe 14 years old, 15, I forget which, was dressed, but he was asleep on the couch. And I'm kind of looking at him, and my wife said, don't you say a word. I listened to my wife. And she pulled out a, a piece of notebook paper, and she said, uh, your son's been praying for you tonight. And the Lord gave him 50 verses for you. And I read them. I still have them at home. I have an outline in my Bible, a Bible study from God. And I won't go into the specifics of it, but in generalities, that the Lord would fight my battle, and he absolutely did, all through the Old and New Testament. And there's two things I want you to get out of that. If you don't listen to another thing I say today, that God will meet you at your point of need, but even more important than that, and this might be Captain Obvious. God knows his Lord. He knows it in French. He knows it in English. He knows it in NASB. He knows it in King James. The verses and the numbers, and the chapter numbers, were added by man. And he loves us enough that he even honors that. Isn't that an amazing God that we serve? I mean, that's, I had to share that. Anyway, we are in. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and this will be a little bit of bridge because I want to honor your time. But I'm going to just show you just how the Holy Spirit just works so well. It's just absolutely amazing. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I got that assignment of, and on August 6th, and I read it through. I said, Mike, I thought you loved me. Um, seriously, I mean, seriously. You look at that. And we will read that through, trust me. But how in the world, Joe Foch from Calvary Chapel in Philadelphia took him four hours to do that. And I'm gonna do this in 25 minutes. Psych. With me doing it, not a chance. But with the Holy Spirit, it's a cinch. And I basically titled this, and it's even gonna be now I, now I am getting excited about doing this. With the extensive help of the Holy Spirit, you'll have an opportunity to experience the church in Thessalonica right here this morning. No smoke and mirrors, no videos in the back, no uh, flip-flops, no passports to fly to Thessalonia, none of that. Just obedience and just listen for the Holy Spirit, and he will do it. So anyway, as I went through this chapter, the Lord just impressed upon me about the word and how we get the word today, the word in Jesus' time, and the word at the time of Thessalonica. Today, I'll, this part I'll abridge. We have the word in about every place you can imagine in print. Got one of these? It's right there on audio or video. Never mind the radio station. Our church is blessed to have one. There's other fine Christian radio stations also around. Christian TV. This town you know, is in, immensely blessed to have all access to that in every size of print, every type of medium. Never mind computers. Never mind, you know, it's out there. We have plenty of that. Let's see. Going back to the time of Thessalonica, we're going to bypass Thessalonica just for a minute 
and we're going to go to how did Jesus handle the word? I think that'd be a pretty good place to begin. And we will start in, again, the, in the verses I'm going to share are by no means exhaustive. But I want you to be able to at least see it in black and white, so I'm not just pulling this out of a hat. The first place I was looking at is Matthew chapter 4. And again, these are just a few verses. Jesus handled the word, well, he did it, well, I understand in John 1, he's the word made flesh. We, we all understand that and appreciate that. But he did the word, he used the word from memory. And he used it in chapter 4, verse 4. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but in every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Later on, in verse 7, he says, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And finally, in verse 10, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. All those from Deuteronomy, he knew it from memory. That was one way. A second way was he used it, he clarified the word. And again, there's many other examples, but one of them I looked at is in Matthew 5, in the part of the Sermon on the Mount, where he would say, in verse 21, we could start with, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits a murder shall be <laughs> liable to the court. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. And one more example, just going down to verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, Tear it out and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your, of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That's the second way that he did it. And then he did it a third way, and I'm sure there's others, but at least for today, if we'll turn to the Gospel of Luke. Again, these are just a few examples, and you might be able to find many more. And in fact, we're going to go a few years back from the time of Jesus' ministry. We're going to go back roughly about 18 years. And here, this is a slight opinion, but I think it, it, it'll make a point. We're going to look at Luke. Here we go. It's here. Okay. Luke uh, 2, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And we, when he became 12, that being Jesus, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it but supposed him to be in the caravan that went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Wouldn't that be something to be asked questions by Jesus? Just, just a thought for the day. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And all those who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And just as a thought, I wonder how many of those folks were around about, eight, about 18 years later when Jesus read Isaiah 61. Just, just wondering. When they saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. It doesn't say it, but it certainly implies it. Was he just going to be sitting in the temple? Do you think by any wild chance he had a chance to look at the scrolls there? I think he did. 
You think that they were just sitting there and just sharing op opinions and just talking back and forth? You know that the scribes and the, or the Pharisees certainly were pulling out the scrolls of the Old Testament. You think Jesus was reading those too? I think so. Does, that, that's an opinion. It's not explicitly said in the Word, but it's explicitly said in the Word when we go to Luke chapter 4, verse 14. There's no doubt here. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. He was called rabbi numerous times in the New Testament. So he, this guy was a, he, uh, this wasn't his first time that he had spoken at all. You just don't let somebody just walk in and, and stand up and, and declare the word. That wasn't going to happen. And he began teaching their synagogues, it was praised by all, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as, he, as, as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. So this is the third way. He read the word. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed him. That's, you think about the word, reading the word. Anyway. And the book to the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set those free who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. <laughs> and the eyes of all in the synagogue, the synagogue were fixed on him. I bet they were. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And in the interest of time, I will bypass the rest of it. By, but, the, but by the end of this chapter, uh, they were, well, I'll just read it. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as, after he sh shared a few more little thing, uh, words with him. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on on which their seed had been built, in order to throw him down the cliff. That's quite a change in uh, attitude, wouldn't you think? In just in a few short minutes, from being praised to being wanting to be murdered. Jeez. Yeah, he hadn't even really uh, his, his public ministry had barely begun. What a way to start! <laughs> but his time hadn't had not yet come anyway, so it wasn't going to happen. All right. So where do we go here? So how do I share what's going on with you know this in 45, it was 45 minutes, we're going to be now to about 15 minutes, and that's okay. When I'm looking at going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, going back here, again, this is a bridge, but this is, this is God's time and the Holy Spirit is just making it very clear. The first part of chapter 5, and we will be reading this, by the way, take my word on it, talks about the return of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to go into the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib stuff. There's books written on it. There's DVDs. Mike's sharing more, and there's, there'll be plenty of information on that. But one thing I think, that what I was, I'm impressed to share, though, you know, even if it takes just a few minutes, to understand, you know, we're, we live in uh, troubled times, to say the least. But just a, a small bit of church history to help, help you understand what's happened in the past, around the years 960 to 1000, chiefly in Europe, there was a thought that Jesus was coming back in the last day of the year, 999, New Year's Eve to New Year's Day. And the church at that time was, I got this information listening to a wonderful message uh, by David Wilker some years, some years ago. It was simply entitled, Jesus is Coming. And the world was apostate, it was wicked. There was a Mohammed. There was an invasion of, of the Mohammedanism throughout Europe. There was uh, calamities going on. There was also the, the bubonic plague. There was all kinds of stuff going on. And they, there was disturbing signs in the heavens, and they, they took Luke 21 out of context. Signs, they thought Jesus was coming in the year 1000, New Year's Eve. And this is what happened. This is, now, yes, there, but there were some believers, and yet there were people that quit their jobs just before that time. Jesus was coming. What's the point of working? Um, some, some of the rich, some of the smaller kings in that, even left their kingdoms, their riches, to 
go to Jerusalem, even join religious orders if that would help things. Farmers stopped planting crops. Jesus was coming. What's the point? There were uh, houses that were running down. Their dwellings needed repair. Jesus was coming. What's the point? Historians quit writing history. There's not going to be any more history. Jesus is coming. So anyway, oh, the wicked. Even the wicked, the last week before, well, let's have one last fling. And they did stuff that even David Wilkerson said, Can I, cannot it be repeated in public? I don't think you have to use your imagination. And they all headed to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion. And midnight approached, as, G as David said. The clock struck 12. No Jesus. 5 after 12, 10 after 12, still didn't show up. And by 6 o'clock in the morning, everyone kind of whew, relaxed. People then started to scoff the message. It happened in the United States also. How about 1843? William Miller um, thought that Jesus was coming in 1843. He believed in Bible numerology. He'd researched this for like 14 years, even had a backer that even helped to write a book entitled Evidence from Scripture that, of Christ's Return in 1843. So, same thing. Some people gathered on the mountaintop. Some dressed in white robes. No Jesus. Well, William, uh, Brother Miller, and then re did his calculations and found out, well, I think I made a mistake. So he, re he reset the date for two or three more times. And after about four times, people just kind of gave up. Anybody remember 1988? 88 regions why Jesus is coming in 1988? Alan Rosh Hashanah at sunrise. I took a vacation day that day. <laughs> Seriously, okay? I've been, I've been saved for nine years. Seriously. My wife kind of rolled her eyes, and she was, she was much in, very much into prophecy, as th those of you that knew her knew that, very much into prophecy and took the time and really researched it, but even she rolled her eyes. So, but what I did hear, what, you know, and I, all I can do, go is by what I heard here. There were more than a few Christians that, since Jesus was coming, maxed out their credit card. What does it matter? That's not a very good witness. So all I know is Jesus is coming. Be ye ready. And any doctrine that robs you of your watchfulness, your expectancy and prayerfulness, is absolutely not of God. Plain and simple. So Jesus made that extremely clear. Actually, one last small little stop before we hit to the main text. I believe it is, oh, it'll be in Acts chapter 1. Very, very familiar scripture. Very familiar, but it's still worth reading. Gathering them, to, starting in verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not, too many, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it th this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said for them, it is not for you to know times or epochs, which is seasons. Epoch, we don't use really that much in today's English, at least I don't. Which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Don't try to figure out the date. Jesus said that over and over and over again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So, not be ye figuring, be ye ready. Final point, and we're going to get this done by noon. I think, or just within a few minutes, if you allow me the leniency. I can't tell you I've always heard the Holy Spirit by a voice, because I haven't. But this was pretty close. When Mike gave me that assignment, I read through uh, chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, and a lot of it, the first part of it talked about the rapture. And 
the, the, the last part talks about, uh, well, I'll just hit these very quickly. For example, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Do you think we could talk 45 minutes about prayer without any problem? There's many exhortations here. But here's the verse that jumped out. Verse 27, there's no throwaway verses. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. That word, that particular word adjure is used exactly once, that particular one in the New Testament. And it's a combination of two Greek words that I can't pronounce and you won't remember anyway. But both of them have to do with uh, legal issues with this and oath swearing. That's about, and, and by the Lord, Paul is making it as abundantly clear. This was a church at Thessalonica. What Bible? They didn't have one. No, I, no, no cell phone, nothing to write notes, no radio station, no electricity. There was no New Testament. Galatians, it may have been written just before then, that's in debate, in James. But this was among Paul's very first letters. They had nothing. There was lots of rumors. In fact, there were so many rumors about, even after Jesus, uh, Paul wrote this one, it necessitated 2 Thessalonians. And I'll, I'll save that for the, those, the, the other men that will be sharing that. But this church, do you want to talk about a dependence on the Holy Spirit? They had each other. They were being persecuted for their faith, some losing jobs. No, you know, the Gospels weren't going to be written. Uh, most of the New Testament was written roughly between 60 and 80, AD, somewhere in that general neighborhood. John, Revelation wasn't going to be written until the mid-90s. John's Gospel and his epistles weren't going to be written until around 90. That was 40 years away. They didn't have Romans Road to share. They didn't have the Gospels, nothing. They had each other, they had the Holy Spirit, and what they would read in the Old Testament. And that's what I think precipitated Paul by the influence of the Holy Spirit. The church needed something written. So there was something that we could all compare to now. Even the Bible that's written today, yes, it can get perverted as far as people and interpretations of it and lack of study, but, it, but that's the Holy Spirit's job to point it out. And without the Holy Spirit, this is nothing more than ink on a piece of paper. It's nothing more than a video that you have on your library. If the Holy Spirit's not there, it ain't going to help. So when I read this in verse 27, here's where I, this is how we're going to go back to Thessalonica, and the Holy Spirit will enable this. We're going to do just what he said. We're going to read First Thessalonians, just read it straight through. That's how they did it then. It won't take that long. And I'm just going to trust the Holy Spirit will deal with you. He did it in the year 51 AD. He'll do it right now. Are we ready? All right. Without commentary. Zero commentary. The Holy Spirit does a much better job than I do. All right. This is in the NASB version, by the way. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of our Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and had been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. Even though as apostles of Christ we, have, we might have asserted our authority, but we proved to be gentle among you. As a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would be his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the church, churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, we are all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown or exultation? Is it not even you at the, in the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind us at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we long to see you, for this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live, if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy from which we rejoice before our God on your account? Or as we, might, or as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we might seek, see your face and complete what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may our Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father as the, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Finally, then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as how you should, ought, how you should walk, and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter 
because the Lord is the avenger to all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warn you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives you, gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. But we, we, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays evil, excuse me, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And, that, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. Without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he will also bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter written, read in all, to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's how the church in Thessalonica got the epistle. No breaks, and it wouldn't surprise me that they would have read it through maybe twice. You've had your trip to Thessalonica. Lord, thank you for your word. I never thought you could uh, show me how I could do this in 22 minutes. But I should not be surprised because you are a God that meets the need. This is your time, and I wanted to honor everyone else's time. We were so blessed with, the, with what's going on in this church. We were certainly blessed with what Hannah had to share today. Because when, you, when, you, when we are in your presence, absolutely nothing else matters. Thank you for your word, and oversee this next week for all of us and those that will be sharing from this pulpit in the near future. In Jesus' name, amen.